There's so much to do, more than we can possibly squeeze into a 24 hour day or even a seven day week. How can we get it all done? Do you ever feel like you're fighting against the clock, constantly in a hurry, whipsawed from one activity to another, just trying to keep your head above water? But what if it doesn't have to be this way? What if your life, your pace, the way you show up in the world, what if it can all be different? The truth is, God designed it to be different. God has a better rhythm in mind, a more joyful and life-giving rhythm. It's called Sabbath. Sabbath not just as one day a week, but as a way of life, as an orientation of the heart. Well, I want to invite you to engage scripture with me, um, but I maybe want to invite you to follow along on the screen or maybe just listen. Um, I, I'm going to start in Exodus this morning, and then I'm going to go to Isaiah. So if you have fast hands, uh, you can certainly follow along in your own Bible, but otherwise it's, it's okay this morning maybe just to listen and, and receive. Uh, so I'm going to start in Exodus 20, uh, verse 1 and 2, then jump to verse 8. So hear the word of the Lord. Then God spoke all these words. I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Then to verse 8, Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work, you, your son or your daughter, your male or female slave, your livestock, or the alien resident in your towns. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Now if you have fast hands, go over to Isaiah 30, starting at verse 15. For thus said the Lord God, the Holy One of Israel, in returning and rest you shall be saved. In quietness and in trust shall be your strength. But you refused and said, No, we will flee upon horses. Therefore, you shall flee. And we will ride upon swift steeds. Therefore, your pursuers shall be swift. A thousand shall flee at the threat of one. At the threat of five, you shall flee until you are left like a flagstaff on the top of a mountain, like a signal on a hill. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Gracious God, we give you thanks this morning for your word. We give you thanks uh, for preserving the, the text that we can hold in our hands so that it might delight, suede, and teach, and convict. God, would all of those things be true this morning? Would you uh, open our ears and our hearts to receive uh, from your word today? God, would the meditations and the words of my mouth and of our hearts together be pleasing to you. In Jesus' name, amen. A show of hands, how many of you have said this week, we're just so busy? How many of you said, if we just had another day in the week? Right? There's no shame in this. I'll raise my hand with you. I I don't ask that question to stir any shame, but I I think the reality is that we we know these statements pretty well, don't we? Again, I don't ask you to raise your hand to draw attention or to draw shame, but the reality is that we feel this way, and we are the only ones that can do anything about this, right? I'm the only one that can do anything about my needing another day in the week, and you're the only one that can do something about your needing another day another day in the week. And if we're honest, we know that we live in this time that it's just super easy to get overcommitted, to get overscheduled, to get overbusy, to get overhurried, right? Can anybody relate? 
Can I get an amen on that? So I'll be honest with you, when my family and I moved here to Northwest Iowa from the Quad Cities, one of the things that we noticed immediately, and one of the things that honestly we fell in love with immediately was the pace of life. No joke, Northwest Iowa pace of life is very, very different than other places. It's so much slower, and it's, it's really nice. It's just a, a, a more intentional pace of life, and we, we noticed it right away. But here's what else th- th- that I noticed, is that my feeling busy or rushed or hurried is relative, because it didn't take long for our lives to start to feel hurried, right? A baseball practice here, a softball practice there, a piano lesson on top of a meeting, on top of something else. It doesn't take long, and we began to start to feel hurried again. But it's interesting for me to reflect on that and realize that it's not really about how much stuff we do as a family. It's not really about how much stuff I do, because objectively, objectively, we are doing less. (laughs) And objectively, the pace of life is slower, and yet I still find myself feeling rushed and feeling hurried, even though the pace and the busyness and the, the load is much, much less. See, this feeling of being stressed and busy and hurried, it's not just me, and, and it's not just you. Hear, hear that, it's not just you. This idea of being busy and rushed and hurried and stressed is sort of an epidemic in America right now, right? I, I did some looking at polls, and I found some super, I don't know, interesting is maybe the right word, maybe sad is another word. I, f- I found a poll that was uh, 2,000 respondents that, that, that responded to this poll about their time. If you were going to guess, of 2,000 people, um, how many minutes a week the average person said they have in free time, what would you say? Get, throw out a number. 45? That's way high. Anybody else? Two, that's way low. (laughs) Right in the middle of those two things. 26 minutes of this poll, 2,000 people on average said they have 26 minutes of free time per week. That's unbelievable, isn't it? I don't know, maybe ours is a little different in a place where the pace is slower, but I don't know if it's that much different. That's unbelievable to me. I think what's also true is that, that busyness and hurry has become a bit of a status symbol, right? Uh, how much we can do has become a, 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 a symbol of how important we are or how valuable we are, right? Whether it's work, you know, when, when we work a crazy number of hours or we try to stay on top of work from our devices and all hours of the day, or, or maybe it's our family, right? When we run our kids from 15 different things and find ourselves rushed, these have become status symbols in our culture. Whether we want them to or not, whether we intend them to or not, they they have. They communicate something about who we are, don't they? Maybe you wonder if it's ever going to stop. Do you find yourself wondering, like, when is this going to stop? Do you find yourself wondering if you're ever going to feel unhurried? That's a good question. It's a good question. I am not a sociologist, but I feel pretty confident standing here in front of you saying that, that life is not going to get slower. The, the pace of culture and the world around us, the, the pace of work, it's not going to slow down. These things don't go backwards, right? It's only going to get faster and faster and faster. So if we want to be less hurried, then, we have to own it. If we want something in our pace and our schedules and our, our, our hurriedness to be different, we have to do something about it. I'm learning something about my own rhythm as we still kind of adjust to this Northwest Iowa pace. I'm, I'm learning that it's really all about my rhythm. The, the feeling of hurriedness is really all about my posture, Right? Am I busy? Yes. Are we busy? Yes. Is our calendar full? Yeah. But I don't think that means that we have to be unhurried, or uh, that we have to be hurried. I don't think it means that we have to be unsettled. I don't think busy and hurried are the same thing. I think the truth is that, that I can do something about being hurried. 
I can do something about being rushed or unsettled. Maybe you don't feel like you can, right? This is maybe true as well. Maybe you don't feel like you can do anything about it. Maybe you feel like you're stuck in this whirlwind of life. But let me say again, it doesn't have to be that way. It doesn't have to be that way. We don't have to be stuck in the whirlwind of hurriedness. Right? My life, your life, my schedule, your schedule, our rhythms and postures, they don't have to be hurried and stressed. They can be different. Now, I know what you're saying because I've said the same thing. Maybe you're saying, oh, geez, just going to get like a five point, a a, a five point thing on how to be less busy. Right? If you do these five things, then you're going to be less busy. That's not it. Those things never work. Uh, tell me if you hear an oxy, oxymoron here. Try harder to be less busy. Do you hear it? It's never going to work. Trying harder to be less busy is never, ever going to work. But here's what I do want to say. Here's what I do think does work. That God designed us to be different. God designed us to live differently. I think he designed us for a different rhythm a better rhythm, a more joyful rhythm, a more freeing rhythm. I think that rhythm is called Sabbath. Not just one day, but a rhythm of Sabbath. That's what we're going to talk about this next uh, six weeks together of how to orient ourselves into a posture of a rhythm of Sabbath. Now, it's no secret that I love the game of baseball. You're like, man, not another baseball story. (laughs) I I love it. I I love the game, but I also love, maybe more than the game itself, I love being at the stadium. I love being in the stands, being a part of the the atmosphere, watching the game. There's nothing else like it for for me than to be a fan in the stadium watching the game. Right? There's a a natural rhythm to the game. Now, for those of you that, that, that don't, know the game that there's this natural kind of ebb and flow of the game it's it's got a rhythm to it right i can sit and watch the game and watch the, the watch the pitcher watch every pitch watch what every pitch does i can watch the the base coaches give signs feverishly to try to pick up what's coming next i can i can scan to see where all the fielders are at i can watch the pitcher shake off pitches from the catcher i can do all those things there's because there's a lot going on But after every three outs, there's sort of a natural stopping. There's sort of a natural slowing because the half inning ends and the players switch sides. There's sort of a a, a natural intermission, if you will. Now, what I like about that, for for me as an extrovert, what I like about that is I I can pause and sit and now kind of be social with the people that I'm with. I can turn and I can catch up. I can say, how's, how's it going? We can talk about our families. We can talk about what we just saw. But it's a natural slowing down. I, th- I think the game, being at those games work best and are most enjoyable for me when I let that rhythm do its thing. When, when I let that rhythm kind of go up and I can pay attention intently and then I can come down and just sort of socialize. That's when I find the most enjoyment, when I can let that rhythm do its thing. I think life is kind of the same way. I think life works best when we let the rhythm that God has given us do its thing. It's this rhythm of Sabbath, a rhythm of six days of work and one day of rest. Now, I'm super aware that the word Sabbath alone might stir something in you. Raise it. Does this stir something in anybody? Yeah. I think the word Sabbath has a, has a way of stirring up things in us. Maybe positive, maybe negative. Maybe it stirs up something that takes you back to childhood. Maybe it stirs up something around rules and restrictions that, that aren't freeing, that aren't joyful, that aren't life-giving. Maybe Sabbath stirs up a, just a list of things you couldn't do. 
Uh, maybe that still is the case for you. Maybe that's still the definition of Sabbath that you hold on to today. Now, some of you know that uh, I facilitate and coach uh, faith walking. And one of the, one of the practices that, that faith walking invites its participants into is Sabbath. A, a regular practice of Sabbath. And in one of the modules I just facilitated um, last year, a, a person in one of the modules came to me and said, what the heck is Sabbath? What the heck is Sabbath and how do I do it? I don't even know how to do it. And they were clearly exasperated. And, and this person said to me, well, I know it's like in, in Sioux County, I can't mow my yard on Sunday. I know that much. But this person was so exasperated because she said, I don't mow my yard, and it's definitely not working. What else do I do? How am I supposed to do this? This was what Sabbath conjured up for her. I, I wonder if this stirs up some of the same things in you. I'm, I'm certain that this person is not alone. And spoiler alert for this series, as your pastor, I want to tell you, you can mow your yard on Sunday. Please, you can do that. <laughs> Because the Sabbath that God gifts us with, gifts you with, gifts me with, is about so much more than just not doing something, right? Sabbath is about so much more than that, right? Sabbath goes all the way back to the Old Testament. It's a Hebrew word. And the Hebrew word was actually a verb. Uh, we, we, we would say Shabbat. That's how Hebrew people would have said Sabbath, Shabbat. If you've seen the, the Chosen, which is super awesome, they say this word a lot, and maybe you had to kind of catch what they were saying, but Shabbat was the word, it was a verb, and it meant to cease and desist, right? Cease and desist. Now, here's the difference. We know in 2023, culturally speaking, we know that we should cease and desist from work, right? Or in the, in the story's case just a minute ago, we know that this person knew to cease and desist from mowing her yard. Right? We know that part of cease and desist, but here's the part that we, that, that we don't often remember. It's a commandment and, and an invitation to cease and desist from achieving, from striving, from needing to produce, right? from needing to do something and to, to, to make something happen with our time. Maybe a, a cease and desist from needing to be effective, Right? I actually wonder if this isn't maybe the hardest part of Sabbath for us in the Midwest. Right? Maybe this is it. In the Midwest, don't we often feel lazy if we're not doing something, if we're not producing something, if we don't have something to show for our time? Well, Sabbath is an invitation to let that go. To let that need to, to do and to, to strive and to achieve and accomplish, to let that go just for a day. See, Sabbath, the commandment for Sabbath shows up in two places, Exodus and Deuteronomy. We're going to look at Exodus. We'll get into the Deuteronomy piece later in the series. Uh, Pastor Kristen is going to come and share on Deuteronomy 5. They're, they're a little bit different in their origins, but we're going to focus on this Exodus passage. And the, 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 the beginning of this Exodus passage, the, the, the model for this Exodus commandment in the Ten Commandments, uh, the fourth commandment, is based around God's pattern of rhythm, right? It's, it's based upon God's pattern of, of creating everything that has been created in six days and then resting on the seventh. If this was God's pattern and God's rhythm, then so too it should be the pattern and rhythm of all the created creatures, which is you and I. We are created creatures by the Creator. Now, here's the, here's the irony, that this is an invitation to imitate God. It's an, imi an invitation to imitate God's pattern. Uh, Mark Buchanan, the writer of The Rest of God, says this, that maybe Sabbath could be defined like this, imitating God so that we can stop trying to be God. This is the irony. When Exodus, when, when, the, when the passage invites us to imitate God, the irony is that, that we're going to find out that we are not God. We imitate God to realize that we can stop trying to be God. In order to 
keep the Sabbath, we have to recognize and we have to come to terms with the reality that, that, that we, we have limits. We have weaknesses. We are, we are from the dust. We are frail creatures. We have actual, real, physical limits. I think, this is my theory, you can push on this afterwards if you want, I think often the case is we don't keep Sabbath because we either don't know how to recognize our limits or we don't want to recognize our limits. We either don't want to recognize that we have to stop, that we need to stop. We either don't know how or don't want to recognize that we aren't God. We can't hold all things together. I might even label that sin. The sin of trying to be God. I think that's what's behind God's words in Isaiah, right? Maybe you heard the Isaiah text and you're like, what the heck is that? All that last part of Isaiah. Those are words of judgment. Those are words of judgment to people who were not, who were not recognizing their own limits, right? Listen to these words again. This is from Isaiah again. It's in returning and resting that you shall be saved. It's in quietness and trust that you shall find strength. But you refused. And you said, we'll flee. This is a picture of people denying their own limits. Trying to run away. And God calls them back. And notice he's calling them to what? Rest. Return and rest. Be quiet, be still. He's calling them back to imitate God. To be still enough to know that their imitation shows them that they, in fact, are not God. Now, it's probably important to pause and just name clearly that God, while he gives us this pattern of of six days of work and one day of rest, God does not need rest. Not like we need rest rest. God doesn't sleep. God doesn't grow tired. God doesn't grow weary. God's not at risk of burnout or exhaustion. God doesn't need the Sabbath. God is complete without rest, but not us, right? We, we know this instinctually, don't we? We know that we need rest. We know that we need to still, we, we know that we need to slow down. We know that even though we say things like, I'll sleep when I'm dead, right? Come on, we all say this, right? And I know we're joking, but somewhere deep inside, like we say this kind of knowing, like we'll just keep running ourselves ragged. We know that that's not going to work. That's not how we were designed to be. Coffee and Red Bull can only go so far, right? We know this. And yet we still choose rhythms other than Sabbath and rest. So God, knowing, <laughs> knowing that left to our own devices, that we would choose something other than this, God knew this and took the lead and showed us how. Showed us what this rhythm looks like. Not just showed us. Not just commanded us. I really do believe, like I want to stand here and say, I believe with all my heart that Sabbath is a gift. That God gives Sabbath to me and to you as a gift. God is the best giver of the best gifts. And this is one of them. And I'm, com- I'm convinced that he commands it only because we wouldn't do it. Right? I'm convinced that it's a commandment only because we would choose something else. It makes me think of Psalm 46. The psalmist writes this. You'll know these words. He writes, Be still and know that I'm God. Did you catch that? Be still. Rest. Slow down. Stop. It's okay. We live in a, a culture that says being still and stopping and resting and slowing is weak. Or, or maybe even lazy. I don't know about you, but I say, okay, that's cool. People can think I'm lazy. <laughs> I'm going to receive the gift. <laughs> But we live in a time that says that's lazy or, or weak. But the truth is, <laughs> the truth is that you and I, we're not the center of the universe. <laughs> the sun doesn't need any of us to rise. God doesn't need us to accomplish what he's doing. We can stop and slow. 
The only way to realize that we're not the center of the universe, the only way to realize that we are not causing the sun to rise and to set is to slow and stop. It's only then do we realize that we aren't the center. So I want to name something else. I want to name that, that I know this isn't easy. I, I, I want to name how hard this really is. And I, I understand that. Keeping Sabbath is, is not easy. There's so many voices and so many opportunities that are so willing to invite us into a rhythm that just says, go, go, go. You, you, don't, you, don't, need the, you don't need the rest. You don't need that one day of rest. You don't need that one day that's different. Just keep going. There's so many voices that allow us to do that. But I want to invite you into something different this series. I really earnestly want to invite you into something different. I want to invite you to try on Sabbath. Maybe in new ways. Maybe in fresh ways. Maybe in ways that you've never thought of before. And there's a few ways I want to do that. Uh, first is that we have, a, we have a scripture reading plan. Maybe you saw this on the way in. On the tables with the offering boxes, there's a little bookmark with five scriptures a week. I, I want to invite you to take one of those bookmarks, engage the scripture. These scriptures are uh, based on the, the text that, that, that we're using as the sermon text every week. And it's just a way for you to, to, to even stop in the mi- middle of the day pause, be still, engage God's words, and see what God stirs in you. So grab one of those on the way out. I can't say enough these books. Engage one of them. These really are good resources to give you tangible, practical understandings of of why God commands this and what we can do about it. It's one thing to know it, right? If you grew up in the church, you know these things. Maybe even if you didn't grow up in the church, we know these things intellectually, we have to find ways to get them from our head to our practice, right? If you tried to, to have these things just intellectually and not, into, not put into practice, we know they don't go anywhere, right? We, we practice what we, what we do. We do what we practice. We hold strong. We, we hold fast. We hold firm to the things that we do. Lastly, each week, we're going to give you a Sabbath practice something tangible that you can put your hands around. And and these are on the back of that bookmark, uh, on the back of the scripture reading plan. Uh, This is just a tangible practice that I want to invite you into, just to try. Try it together, and and let's see what that feels like together. I I maybe even, I'm going to be kind of bold here. Um, I want to invite you into something. If you're willing to give this a shot over the next six weeks, I'm not going to follow up with you, but would you just, like, raise a hand? Are you willing to try Sabbath with me? Yeah? I'm not going to follow up. Nobody's going to come ask you, but I think there's something that happens when we put a hand in the air and we say, look, I'm going to give my word to this. These Sabbath practices are something that we can give our word to, something we we can actually put into practice and do together. This week's practice is this. Set some time apart this week and make it special, different from all other times uh, of your week. I want to urge you as strongly and as graciously as I can to set aside a whole day for Sabbath. I think that's what Scripture shows us. I think that's the gift that God gives us. A whole day is a gift. I would encourage you to make, a, make it a Sunday. I, I think there's something important about Sabbath where we gather together in God's presence like this, together as a community, as brothers and sisters. And, and I also get that this might not be possible. I worked in a manufacturing plant for a long time, and I worked a lot of weekends. I get it. This might not be possible. So if it's not possible for you, start somewhere. Maybe it's not a whole day. Maybe it's a couple hours. Right? Maybe it's just a couple hours where you set those couple hours aside and make them different from the rest of your week. I love these words. Make the time different. Have you ever heard these words applied to a Sabbath before make the time different? I find these words so helpful. I think about it like this. If 
if I would normally on those six days bury my head in my phone on my Sabbath, I'm, I'm going to try not to do that. I'm going to choose something other than burying my head in my phone. If, if I'm going to binge watch 10 episodes of The Office on those six previous days, which we might, I'm going to try not to do that on my Sabbath. Practically speaking, here, here's something that, that, that I put into practice. I work primarily with my mind, right? I, I primarily use my mind to work. So on my Sabbath, I try to use my hands. That's why I say, go ahead and mow the yard. If, if I don't use my hands on my Sabbath, there's a whole part of God's creation that's not going to get exercised, right? This is why I tell people to m- mow their yard. And, and, and do it in a different way, right? Do it in a way that's not just not just another checklist item, not just something to check off so you can be productive. I would say to this person in faith walking, mow the yard and notice the smell of the grass. Notice the clouds in the sky. Notice the noises. Notice the lines in the grass. Notice how the grass lays over when you walk on it. Notice what God's stirring, right? These are ways to make the time different. So if you work with your hands, maybe Sabbath with your mind. Whatever it is, I just cannot urge and encourage enough. Try this on. Make the time different. And as you think about what that looks like, hear these words uh, from Jesus. This is from Mark 2. Jesus says, Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. Sabbath was made for humans, not humans for the Sabbath. That means that Sabbath is not just a commandment, it's a blessing. It's not just a commandment, it's a a blessing. It's a gift. Here's some questions you can ask. As you think about trying these on this week, you can ask some of these questions. Does what you're trying on honor God? Does what you're practicing, does it bring you energy in life? Does it stir gratitude? Does it stir a sense of gratitude towards God? Does it make you aware of God's presence in your life and the ways that he's showing up in your life? Does it give you rest and renewal? If the answer is yes to that, no matter what that looks like, if the answer is yes, then you're probably keeping Sabbath well. I know we're all busy. I get it. I know that we're all super busy, and I know that it can be so challenging, but I want to urge one more time, please give this a try this six weeks. I have this tremendous gift coming up of a, a sabbatical. It's a privilege. It's, it's a privilege that the RCA and the Trinity and all of, all of you would allow me to do this, to enter into Sabbath in this way, but I, I really, really hope that we together can engage Sabbath for six weeks in a way that's new and fresh and life-giving. I really hope that this is something that stirs in the hearts of of all of Trinity Church together. I I want you to join me. I pray that you join me, not to just do another thing. Sometimes it feels like you get asked to do a lot of things. This isn't it. I'm I'm not asking you just to do another thing. I'm asking you to, to stop, to slow, to ask God to show you the the baggage that you carry around. To have the courage to ask God to to show up and give you you the ability to slow. While the rest of the world is just going faster and faster and faster, may we be a people that's unhurried. I pray that we can begin to live into a, a rhythm. A rhythm that's healthy. A rhythm that's fruitful. A rhythm that's predictable like a baseball game that that we know six days of work and one day of rest not just so that we can check it off the list not just so we can do more right i I think there's this there's this misconception that that sabbath is the way that we, we we work six days and we wear ourselves out and then we rest so that we can go into the next six days and be super productive that, that, we can, that, that we can work harder and faster than anybody that doesn't take Sabbath. I don't, think that's, I don't think that's what Scripture shows us. 
I don't think that's the picture of Sabbath that we see in Exodus or Deuteronomy. I don't think that's the heart of the commandment. I don't think that's the heart of the gift. I don't think Sabbath is a task to do so that we might be rewarded with success. I don't think Sabbath is something that we do so that, so that God might make us more productive, that we might achieve more. I really do think Sabbath is the gift. I don't think it's something to be checked off the list. I think Sabbath is the reward, right? Sabbath is the gift. Sabbath is the blessing. I want to end with these words. These are words of Jesus from Matthew's gospel. These are words that, that you're going to hear a lot, that I hope are sort of the foundation of our time together these six weeks. This is from the message version of Matthew's gospel. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. Learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's pray. Gracious God, we, um, we acknowledge who you are, that you are God of the universe, the creator of all that's been created, the giver of all good gifts, in fact, the giver of all the best gifts. God, I pray that we might uh, together um, have the courage and have the, have the desire to lean into your gift of Sabbath together. God, would you stir in us a desire for your rest? Would you stir in us a, a, a real desire to let go of the things of achieving and accomplishing? Would you stir in us a, a, a desire to let go of those, those meanings that we make when we, when we slow down and we stop, that, 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 that we aren't doing our part, that we're lazy or weak? God, would you stir in us the the realization that you call us into rest because it's good. And that this is who we are, a people of Sabbath rhythm, designed for rhythm, designed for rest. Would you stir in us a realization that this is the true rhythm of true life? God, we love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.